Hey everybody, Kevin Baxter back again with Pro Twin Performance. This is going to be our last little tech video for this year. Uh, we're going to shut it down and uh, let the crew and everybody enjoy their Christmas holiday and New Year, and we'll be back in on January 2nd. So, with this being the last video of the year, I thought I would hit on a topic that uh, it, you, you hear all kind of great stuff. Uh, torque versus horsepower. beans. I'm not going to do a lot of math on this one. Uh, my challenge here is going to try to simplify this as much as I possibly can. So let's say torque versus horsepower made easy. So um, we're, we're going to give this a shot and, and we'll jump right in and uh, just let this be our last great video of 2019. So torque versus horsepower. Let's start with this, okay? Um, Torque is a force that is applied at a given distance, okay? So let's use this for example, a ratchet, all right? So this ratchet is about six inches long, okay? So essentially it's a lever. So at the center of a wrench, you would have the, the center point here is going to be your, let's call it a fulcrum, since it's a lever. The amount of of pressure that I put here at this given distance is a resulting torque. So it, that is measured in either foot pounds or newton meters for the metric guys. So let's pretend this wrench is six inches long. If I apply two pounds of pressure here at six inches long, the resulting force is one foot pound. Okay, now let's look at this. Okay, this is approximately 24 inches long. So same thing, if I applied two pounds worth of force here at 24 inches long, we do our math, it's force applied times the distance, so two pounds times two feet, the resulting force is four foot pounds. So that explains that. The interesting thing about torque is it's also easily manipulated through gearing. So when you hear, again, dyno numbers, that they're talking about rear wheel dyno numbers versus engine output numbers. There are several factors that come into play with torque. Okay, first off is the torque manipulation through the gearing, through the primary, through the transmission, and also your secondary drive. You also have parasitic losses that occur with those gear reductions and increases, but that's for a totally different video, and we said this would be torque and horsepower made easy, so we're not going to get into parasitic loss. So now that everybody knows what torque is, what is power? Well, power is the rate that the work is done. Force, or excuse me, torque being the work. So if I apply a given amount of torque, two pounds of pressure, on this six inch long wrench, the faster that I do it, I requires more power to make that happen quicker. If I do it slowly, that's less power, even though I'm putting in the same amount of force or, or uh, same amount of force. So if I apply more pressure faster, more work is being done, okay? So I hope that makes sense. Now, Horsepower and uh, horsepower essentially is a result of math. So your torque again is determined by your force applied times the distance. Your horsepower is the torque times the RPM. So that's where your horsepower derives from. Okay, now let's see. Let, let me show you how this applies to engines. This set of connecting rods, and this is a flywheel assembly out of a twin cam. So we have the same thing going on inside the twin cam on the flywheel. Imagine the center here is the same as the fulcrum point. The center of the flywheel is the same as the fulcrum point on your wrench. The, see the circle? That's the wrist pin. That is what the connecting rods are uh, connected to and rotate around. Your pistons would be on the top. So in this situation, the distance 
from the center point, the fulcrum here, uh, to this wrist pin here is your leverage. Uh, that your lever is being produced. That is your force being applied. Okay. The further, I mean, God, this thing's heavy. I should have worked out today. Um, the further you move this pin out, you're moving it further away from the center point or the fulcrum, just like using a longer wrench. The further you move that out, you are effectively producing more torque. Okay, so if we go from say a four inch crankshaft to a four, four inch stroke to a four and three eighths, we are increasing the engine's ability to produce more torque because we have moved that lever out. Okay, now the faster that the crank spins, if you're supplying the same force means that more work is being done and you make more power. Okay, so that's why you see on a dyno sheet, a horsepower chart, uh, looking at the horsepower, the horsepower keeps going up and up and up. The faster that, you know, as the RPMs increase, keeps going up and up and up because more overall work is being done because you're applying the same force over a shorter period of time and it's moving faster and faster. So more work is being done. Okay. Um, hey, Clay. How you doing, man? Uh, so, as one of the limiting factors, okay, is the RPM range because of your valve train components and just the overall design of the engine, is the RPM, the safe RPM limits of the engine itself. So we've got a very limited range in the amount of time that we can do that work, okay? Um, let me get a couple of thumbs up, make sure everybody's following me on this. Okay, we're good, we got thumbs up. So we know we're limited by the RPM due to the valve train components. So in order to do more work, that's what we're doing. We have to do more work in order to increase our rate of acceleration. So one way that we can do more work within our limited RPM range is by increasing the torque. We move that one out, we get a longer stroke. And ultimately, what happens is it makes the bike faster by increasing the stroke. Or you can also do it through gear. Because remember, you can manipulate the torque, the force applied, which increases the amount of work that can be done. So you can raise your RPMs, do it through gearing. By raising the RPMs, the engine will spin faster because the engine is spinning faster. It can produce more work, make more power in a shorter amount of time. Okay. Now, when how does this translate to dyno sheets? Uh, so on a dyno sheet, everybody that's seen them, you've seen uh, your, your torque and horsepower curve. All right. Now, there, there's no question that you, you know, when you, when you see your peak number on a dyno sheet, that would translate to when you're riding the bike, that's when you feel the pull the most. When you feel that pull the most is when the engine is at its peak power, okay? So essentially your peak torque. So why doesn't a higher peak dyno number always result in a faster bike? That's the big question. Well, what we have to remember is when dyno runs are done, uh, they're done in one gear, okay? So typically it's fourth gear that your dyno pulls are done. So what we have to remember is that that force and power that's being applied is only being measured through the RPM range in that given gear. So when that translates to how you normally ride, which is most people on the street are going through first, second, top of third gear, maybe into the beginning of fourth gear, and then they shut it down because they've run out of room or cojones, let's be honest. So the, um, that measurement of that peak dyno number being run in fourth gear isn't necessarily an overall perspective of how fast that bike will be in real world conditions, okay? So what we have to consider when we're looking at dyno sheets is our actual area under the torque curve, 
okay? So that, that greater average area under the torque curve is going to indicate the engine's ability to perform work in the total overall given amount of time. Okay, so your peak torque number or peak horsepower number will, the higher number will not always result in the fastest bike because we have to measure the total amount of work done over the given time. So we have to take into consideration that area under the torque curve and, and, and how efficiently and well it's producing power or doing work over that given amount of time. So to to accelerate the fastest, that's the goal, is we, is we want to increase our average rate of acceleration as much as possible. So the way we do that is we want to operate the engine, <coughs> excuse me, we want to operate the engine at its peak torque. Okay, that's going to produce the highest uh, uh, average rate of acceleration. So that being said, what we have to consider when you're choosing builds and you're looking at dyno sheets, you know, the saying out there is, you know, uh, horsepower sells parts, torque wins races. That's not always the case, of course, but the idea is that when you choose your engine build and you're looking at dyno sheets, you would want to choose a, a build where the peak torque is more focused in the primary area that you ride. Okay, now in a, in, in a, in a Harley-Davidson engine, you know, typically we're operating between 2,000 and, you know, 6,000 to 6,200 RPM. Okay, and these engines, because of the characteristics and limitations of the valve train, you only have about a 3,000 RPM window uh, that, that you can really take advantage of all the power that you have on tap. So if you think of how you ride, you come out, you, you never go below 2,000 RPM, and even with a, you know, a moderate aggressive shift, typically 4,000 to 4,500, most of your riding being done 2,500 to 3,200 right there in the middle. So I see a lot of people picking builds where that peak torque, now this, I say this, this is an exception to racing, of course, we're talking street engines, um, where your, most of your operation is done around 3,000 RPM on average. So I would want to choose a build where my peak torque was in that in that 3000 rpm range so i've got 1500 rpm below it 1500 rpm above it that i can take advantage of that peak torque on curve there so i try to push that torque number a little lower in the rpm range because that's where i spend 90 percent of my time now when you do that one thing to remember we're going to go back to the crank here Okay, as we increase this distance, we in, are increasing our force, our torque, the crank actually has to rotate further. Okay, the crank itself is still rotating 360 degrees, but the pin itself is traveling a further distance over its circumference, which means effectively it's turning slightly slower, so we've removed some of its ability to perform work, but that's where gearing comes in. Okay, so it, it's very similar to diesel engines. Let's talk, I'll switch gears on that and then I think we'll shut this down because I, I think I've, I've, I've gotten about as deep as I, I, I want to on, get on this one. Um, diesel engines, for example, have a very, very long stroke and they produce an enormous amount of torque for their cubic inch displacement, especially when you look at the... Um, uh, you look at the engine RPMs, for example. So, you know, diesel engines typically, you know, say a, a, a power stroke is, a, you know, a new Ford power stroke diesel. You know, they redline at less than 4,000 RPM. They don't need RPMs. They don't need speed because there is so much leverage due to the stroke. Okay, so they don't need to turn an enormous amount of RPMs in order to produce power or do work they can do it at a very, very slow RPM, okay? Where the difference comes in is they also have taller gearing, much taller rear end ratios, much taller gears in the transmission to take advantage of that large amount of force that is being applied because of the incredibly long stroke. So if we flip the other side, get back into the motorcycle side of things, sport bikes, okay? They turn very high RPMs. They produce very high horsepower numbers 
relatively low torque numbers, but they also have to run very short gearing to get the RPMs up so that the power produced will overcome the lack of force being applied because of the very short stroke. Okay, I hope all of that makes sense, guys. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, you can post them in the comments below. And uh, we put these, uh, these little live things, we put them up on YouTube as well. So if you want to uh, subscribe to the channel there, you can. There's a bunch of stuff on there. And uh, everyone, have a very, very Merry Christmas. Have a Happy New Year. And thanks again for watching. We appreciate you. Take care of yourselves.